This is a 2012 Porsche Panamera, and it's cheap, really cheap, under $30,000 cheap. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's not ultra high miles, it's not damaged. It's just that the Panamera has gone from a car that only the coolest ultra rich people can afford to something that you can now buy used for less than the price of a Camry. And today, I'm going to review this Panamera to find out if you should. I've borrowed this Panamera from CNC Motors, which is an exotic car dealership here in Southern California that has an amazing inventory of incredible cars, from muscle cars and classics to multi-million dollar exotics. They have one of the best showrooms of any dealerships on Earth, and you can check them out by clicking the link in the description below. So let's talk Panamera. The Panamera first came out for the 2010 model year, 10 years ago, hard to believe. But the original Panamera models were S versions with a 400 horsepower V8. And there was also a 500 horsepower turbo V8. The next year, Porsche added a 300 horsepower V6 to the model range like this car. And those early Panamera V6 models are typically the cheapest ones on the used market today. But don't be fooled by the fact that this is the base model entry level Panamera. This car still does zero to 60 in 5.6 seconds, which is pretty good for a full size luxury sedan. And it also looks fairly modern since Porsche hasn't really changed the Panamera all that much over the years. Plus, this car still drives like a Porsche, and it has a surprising amount of luxury features, especially for under 30 grand. So today, I'm going to take you on a tour of an early Panamera V6, and I'm gonna show you all of the interesting quirks and features of what's probably one of the best Porsche bargains on the market today. Then I'm gonna get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the Panamera in the interior. And the first thing you notice when you climb into this interior is that it's pretty nice. Even though this car is almost 10 years old and starting to get cheap, it has the more modern look Porsche interior. In fact, this was the first car to debut sort of the latest layout of Porsche interior when the Panamera first came out. And the result is the interior still looks modern, refreshed, up to date, even compared to new Porsche models that are almost 10 years newer than this car. Unfortunately, this particular Panamera has a bit of an elderly person interior color situation going on. You have a beige interior, which has fallen out of favor very quickly in the luxury car world. It's mixed with this light wood on the steering wheel and in the dashboard and in the center console. And you also have this ruffled leather seating designed to be more comfortable and look more like old school leather. Most Porsche models didn't have it. You had to specify it. And the person who originally bought this Panamera did. But despite the relative modern interior in this car, there are some interesting quirks worth noting. I'm going to start with one thing that has always bothered me about Porsche models from this era, and that would be the steering wheel. Now, this interior, you have leather everywhere, wood, aluminum, everything looks very nice, top quality materials. Then you get to the steering wheel center, and it's this cheap beige plastic. It's such an odd place to cheap out. The center of the steering wheel that you're looking at all the time, but that's where Porsche decided to go cheap. I find that to be such a strange decision. It just doesn't really look all that nice, and it's like the only bad material in this entire interior, but it's right in your line of sight. And next up, another interesting quirk up here. Between the two front seats, you have one cup holder. So you, the driver, and your passenger can argue over who gets to use the cup holder. But in case this turns into a serious argument, good news, there are more cup holders, they're just hidden. They're over on the passenger side of the dashboard. You push down this little silver panel and you can pop out two more cup holders. And that way the passenger gets two cup holders, but the driver gets the one premier center cup holder. Next up, something else I absolutely love in this interior is over to the left of the steering wheel, there's a little sticker that has a 
speed limit on it. You may be wondering, what is this about? Well, this car has all-season tires, and with the all-season tires that Porsche put on from the factory, they weren't rated to go more than 150 miles an hour. Now, this isn't a problem for most German automakers because they limit their cars to around 150 miles an hour electronically, but Porsche doesn't believe in electronic speed limiters. So, this car could go more than 150, but the tires weren't intended to, and Porsche solved that problem by putting a little decal next to the ignition switch in order to remind you not to exceed 150 <laughs> because your tires could have a problem. That's an interesting way of solving what could be a rather catastrophic safety issue. And next up, something I've always liked in this interior, if you look on the door sill, you can see there's an armrest, just like on basically all door sills. But the interesting thing here is if you open the door, the armrest continues for like two inches onto the B pillar. There's just a little space in there for more armrest ability. Now, obviously, Porsche didn't have to do that. They could have just ended the armrest on the door panel, which would have been cheaper and easier. But they did because that's what you do in a luxury sedan when you're committed to attention to detail. It's a pretty good touch. And next up, moving on to the center of this interior, you can see it has this giant center console full of buttons, just like the latest Porsche models do, although they're evolving a bit from this. But this was the latest and greatest Porsche had in 2010. The problem I've always had with this center console with all the buttons is that if you don't get a lot of options, you do get a lot of blank switches, buttons that would have gone on there if you had a more expensive car. And this car is great proof of that. You can see there are four blanks on the driver's side and four more blanks on the passenger side. And every time you get in, you're basically reminded that you skipped a lot of the other options that would have filled out your center control stand. Now, automakers who integrate all of their features into their infotainment system don't really have this blank button problem. But Porsche at this time was committed to making buttons for basically everything. And that meant if you didn't get everything, you had some blanks. Now, next up, another important notable item in the center console, you can see the shift lever. This car has Porsche's PDK dual clutch automatic transmission. That transmission came out for the 2009 model year. The Panamera first came out in 2010, so it was one of the very first cars to use PDK. Now, PDK is excellent. It's very robust, very reliable, and it shifts very quickly. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when I drive this car in a little bit. And finally, our last interesting item up front here is the center screen. Now, this center screen is almost 10 years old, but you can see it is surprisingly responsive. You tap it and it does stuff almost immediately. It's not large like modern screens, and you can't move around the map with just a swipe of the finger very easily. There's no pinch to zoom, that kind of thing, but it is a relatively responsive screen, not anywhere near as frustrating as like mid-2000s cars where you try to change the radio and it beeps and it waits like eight seconds. This thing is way, way better than that, despite its age, and that's a pretty good thing when you're buying a heavily depreciated used luxury car. You don't have to compromise quite as much as you might think on infotainment technology. And next up, we move on to the back seats in the original Panamera, which in my opinion is more interesting than the front seats in part due to the size. Now I'm six foot three, six foot four, and as you can see, I fit in here just fine. My head has a couple of inches before it hits the ceiling. My knees fit behind the front seat perfectly fine fit back here, which is unusual in a car like this. And that's because while the Panamera was being developed, the CEO of Porsche was a tall man by the name of Wendelin Wiedeking. And during the development, he issued an edict that this car had to be able to seat him comfortably in the back. And that's why there's so much headroom and legroom in the back of the Panamera. But this caused a problem. You see, Porsche always wanted the Panamera to look like a coupe because entering the sedan world was kind of a big move for Porsche and they wanted to tie it into the look of its well-known coupe models like the 911. But it'd be hard to make a coupe fit tall people in the back. And so it's because of this tall person edict that the original Panamera 
kind of looked weird because they had to keep the tall roof line all the way through the rear seats and then they had to taper it off very quickly behind the rear seats to make it look like a coupe and that's what contributed to the Panamera's kind of strange styling in its first few model years. Nobody really loved how that looked, but that's the reason why. Porsche wanted to be able to seat four adults in this car comfortably, and it came at the expense of its appearance. Now, another interesting thing in the back seat of the Panamera is that the back seats are bucket seats. You don't have a three-person bench back here. Instead, you have two individual seats, meaning that the Panamera was a four-seater. Now, this is no longer the case. The Panamera is now offered with a middle seat if you want one, but in the early models, you could only get it this way with two seats in the front and two seats in the back. So, of course, you might be wondering what exactly takes the place of the middle seat since it isn't here? And the answer is, well, you have this nice strip of wood trim, which looks good. At the very front of this trim, you can push this little lid and reveal a cup holder. Or further back, you can open up this storage compartment and you have another cup holder and a little more storage and a power outlet. Nothing particularly special in all of this stuff. Of course, you can also drop the center armrest between the seats if you want extra comfort, and then you can open it up for extra space storage. But generally the answer is Porsche didn't really do all that much cool stuff with the extra space they had in the back. Instead, they wanted to make it a four-seater, I think, to emphasize that it wasn't intended to be some boring family car, but rather a high-performance touring car that just happened to have four doors. And next up, another notable item back here is the screens. These are not aftermarket screens. This was a very rare option called the Porsche Rear Seat Entertainment System. You can see the Porsche logo when you turn on these screens. This screen back here allowed you to select music, USB auxiliary, or a CD if you wanted. And there was also something called Crosslink that was some kind of TV tuner that you had to have some extra stuff installed to make it work. But you can see there's a USB port and an aux port below the screens that you can plug into and then you can listen to your desired music in the back. But of course, Porsche wouldn't sell this car with just rear screens and then you had to go buy your own headphones. Actually, that does sound like something Porsche would do, but not in this case. The headphones are hidden in a little cubby behind the rear seat headrest. You reach back there and you can pull out the headphones. You can see they are wireless headphones and they say Porsche on them, which makes them extra cool. These aren't just stupid, boring headphones. You have Porsche branded ones. And next up, we move around to the back of the Panamera and onto the trunk, which is actually a hatchback, which is something I've always found kind of interesting, distinctive from all the other luxury sedans. And when you open it up, you can see it really is a cargo area and not a trunk. It's open to the passenger compartment and the rear seats fold down, meaning you can get a really large cargo area in here if you need to carry larger items in your Porsche luxury sedan. The result of that is that the Panamera is almost as practical as a true station wagon, just a little bit less practical thanks to its sloping rear design. But otherwise, you have the cargo capacity of a wagon back here, and I've always felt it's kind of a weird thing. It's almost like Porsche snuck a station wagon into the full-size luxury sedan market it without anybody ever really noticing but that's pretty much exactly what this is. It's also worth noting that with the cargo hatch closed, you can see this car's sloped back design, which was a big point of controversy when it first came out, but it kind of started a trend. This was one of the very first sloped back design cars, along with the Honda Accord Cross Tour back in 2010, and a lot more cars adopted this design language later, and this is a trend that still continues today, although most of the modern sloped back cars are better looking than the original Panamera. And finally, one other item worth noting back here is the spoiler. The spoiler is currently in the up position, but you can press a little button in the center control stack and that will lower the spoiler in case you want to go in stealth mode. But press the button again, the spoiler goes back up and you'll get just a little bit more attention, which is probably what you're looking for if you spend less than 30 grand on a used Panamera. And 
And finally, we move under the hood in the Panamera and into the engine bay. And the very first thing that strikes you here is just how much empty space there is under the hood. Obviously, that's because this is a V6 model. There were Panameras sold with larger V8 engines that would have taken up more space under here. And you can really tell that you cheaped out. This is the engine bay equivalent to those blank switches in the interior. By the way, one other interesting piece of information about the Panamera, as Porsche enthusiasts and car enthusiasts know, Porsche has three digit model codes that distinguish all of the different models and generations like the 993, the 996, the 991, etc. This era of the Panamera was called the 970, the 970, not as well known, but you can see in this little label on the hood, it says 970. 70 at the front. That was the internal Porsche model designation for the original Panamera. And finally, since I'm out here, I want to talk styling. Now, I have never loved the look of the original Panamera, mainly for the reason I mentioned. The roof line just goes too far and flat, and then it curves down so quickly it always looked weird and awkward trying to turn a sedan into a coupe. But I have to say that in my opinion, they never really improved it dramatically. The newer Panamera models do look nicer but it's not like they've made it into a truly beautiful car. It's generally the same look, except for a few things modernized here and there and a slightly new treatment on that roof line. Truthfully, this car looks to most people like a brand new Panamera. And if you buy one of these for 30 grand or less, you will get many people asking you where your newfound wealth came from because it looks so similar. And my view is if you're looking to impress people and you're trying to stretch to afford a newer Panamera, don't. No one can tell the difference. You will impress people with this one just as much. It doesn't look great, but then again, none of the Panameras really do. And so those are the quirks and features of the original Porsche Panamera. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the original Panamera six cylinder. Now, I've got a lot of experience uh, driving these. I've spent a lot of time in Panamera models. I've always been impressed by the six cylinder. It's not a particularly fast car. It's not really that exciting, but it's fast enough. Um, you know, the turbo will just totally knock your socks off, but this one is more than fine on everyday commuting in Florida. Not fast, but quick enough, definitely gets up to the speed of traffic reasonably quickly. And one of the big benefits is this car would feel slow if it wasn't for the PDK. The dual clutch automatic transmission really goes a long way to making this car feel quick and fast enough um, and actually enjoyable. So in terms of acceleration, I think this car is totally reasonable. Yes, it makes more sense. You want an S, you want a turbo to get more performance, but these are the cheaper ones. And so if you want a Panamera, this is a good place to go. Now, as for the handling, two thoughts here. Um, pro and con. The pro is that this car truly handles like a Porsche. Um, I've driven a bunch of these, always impressed by how flat they feel in corners, how balanced the steering feels. It is a step above the 7 Series, the S-Class, that sort of thing. I remember when the original Cayenne came out, Porsche promised the Cayenne would make the X5 feel like a truck, and it didn't. Um, but the Panamera does make the S-Class and the 7 Series feel like the big cars they are. This car feels way, way more nimble than you'd think when you're going around corners. The drawback is it is a big car. So even though Porsche is able to neutralize the size when you're going around corners and curvy roads, they can't do anything about the car's physical size limitations in like a big city where you're in tight spaces, tight parking spots. And that was always something that annoyed me um, about the Panamera. It's just big. It basically has the footprint of a Range Rover. It's a large vehicle. And so even though you're going around corners, it's nimble, you can forget the size. When you're trying to squeeze into a tight parking space, you don't forget the size. Now at a stoplight, this car feels very nice, very luxurious. I will say it does not have the same comfort feel of an S-Class. So if you're looking for a car, that is very coddling and very luxurious and very quiet and soft. This is most of those things, but it's just not on the level of an S-Class or a 7 Series. Ultimately, this is a great car, and the fact that this is under 30 grand is just amazing. And that's especially amazing because I get in this car and I'm touching the buttons and I'm feeling everything.
everything. Everything still feels as tight and as well put together and as well designed as it did 10 years ago when this came out. The turn signal stock still feels tight. The steering still feels good. Suspension, all the buttons work, the switches. The car is just well made. Um, and I think this is a fairly reliable car. And if I was gonna consider a 10 year old luxury sedan, um, I would be worried about Mercedes and BMW before I was worried about Porsche in terms of ownership costs. For the price point, it is an unbeatable car, especially if you just want people to look at you and think that you have a lot of money. There's a lot of people out there who are in that world, um, and this is absolutely, I would say this is the number one car for that at this price point. And so that's the original Porsche Panamera V6. This car isn't perfect. It's not as nice or as modern looking as the latest Panamera, but it's not that far off. It doesn't have the same luxury equipment as a new Panamera, but again, it's relatively close. And it's not as fast as a V8 or a turbo model, but it isn't exactly slow. But the real benefit is the price. There is probably no car on earth where you could spend less than $30,000 and look as rich as you could if you got a used Panamera. And now it's time to give this one a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Panamera from this era looks, well, uh, not great, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in the low 5 second range, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Handling is shockingly sharp given the car's size, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is okay, it's reasonably quick and sporty, but it's still a V6 big sedan, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Cool factor is fairly strong, cooler than other big sedans from this era, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 26 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Panamera is reasonably well equipped and it earns a 6 out of 10. Comfort is good, but not as good as rival luxury sedans, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is truly excellent. These are reliable and well built, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a luxury sedan. Its larger cargo area is a benefit, but four seats is a drawback, so it balances out for a 5 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is a seriously good one. It's amazing how much performance and luxury and status this car offers for under 30 grand, and it gets an 8 out of 10 for a total daily score of 34 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 60 out of 100, which places it here against other luxury cars from this era and a few relevant Porsches. The early Panamera really is a bargain, if you can get past the styling, and I highly recommend it if you want a family car but you don't want to settle for the same normal boring stuff.